Okay, we're ready. The appointed hour is six o'clock having been reached. I call this meeting of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals to order. My name is Steve Judge. As ZBA chair, I want to welcome everyone to this meeting. Pursuant to chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. Additionally, the meetings, uh, meeting will be recorded and may be viewed on the Town of Amherst YouTube channel and ZBA webpage. In accordance with provisions of Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 40A, and Article 10, Special Permit Granting Authority of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw, this public meeting has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed to parties at interest. We will begin with a roll call of members of the ZBA. Uh, Steve Judge, I'm here. Uh, Ms. Parks? Here. Mr. Maxfield? Here. Mr. Meadows? Here. Mr. Gilbert? Here. Mr. Cochran? Here. Ms. Winters? Here. Also in attendance tonight is Maureen Pollock, planner with the town, Rob Mora, building commissioner, Dave Wasevitz, a senior building inspector, and John Thompson, senior enforcement officer. The Zoning Board of Appeals is a quasi-judicial body that operates under the authority of Chapter 40A of the General Laws of the Commonwealth for the purpose of promoting the health, safety, and convenience and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. One of the most important elements of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw is Section 10.38. Specific findings from this section must be made for all our decisions. All hearings and meetings are open to the public and are recorded by town staff. The procedure is as follows. The petitioner presents the application to the board during the hearing, after which the board will ask questions for clarification or for additional information. After the board has completed its questions, the board will seek public input. The public speaks with the permission of the chair. If a member of the public wishes to speak, they should so indicate by using the raised hand function on their screen. The chair, with the assistance of the staff, will call upon people wishing to speak. When you are recognized, provide your name and address to the board for the record. All questions and comments must be addressed to the board. The board will normally hold public hearings where information about the project and input from the public is gathered, followed by public meetings for each. The public meeting portion is when the board deliberates and is generally not an opportunity for public comment. If the board feels that it has enough information and time, it will decide on each on the, upon the applications. Each petition heard by the board is distinct and evaluated on its own merits, and the board is not ruled by precedent. Um, tonight's agenda, a public meeting. This is an administrative meeting to discuss ZBA standards, conditions for, and conditions for residential use permits permitted by the special permit, items raised by the ZBA members for discussion, general public comment period, and other business not anticipated within 48 hours. And then, of course, the journey. So one of the things we wanted to do tonight uh, is really pursuant to a couple of uh, requests that we've had from members and is probably going to be helpful, especially for our newer members, is to review um, generally so the uh, zoning bylaw and, and the Massachusetts statutory framework for the ZBA, um, its role, its authority, how it's framed, it's how it's discretion and the zoning bylaws are, uh, are framed by both the bylaw and, and the state laws, number one. Number two, also then discuss the kind of conditions that we have put on in the past and kind of have a, a discussion about the conditions that, are, that are, have been imposed uh, on special permits. Open that up to discussion from people in the, on the board and uh, get the enlightenment of the staff to help us with both the history as well as um, implications of, of decisions that we would make on, in terms of, of conditions. So what I had done is ask the staff to create um, a kind of an opening introduction and uh, sort of a, a primer on, Z, on the ZBA. And I think Maureen has pulled that together. I think, Maureen, has everybody gotten a copy of the PowerPoint or are you just gonna go through it uh, on the... 
Uh, the, I did uh, only this afternoon just uh, emailed yeah. everyone the PowerPoint. Um, so if you haven't um, got a chance to review it, it um, well, we'll review it tonight. And also it, um, it, I did send it, it, it via uh, email earlier today. Great. So Maureen, would, um, would you start with that? And I guess my question to you is if you, if members have questions, um, do you want them to hold them till the end or should they raise their hand and um, ask the questions that during the presentation, what's most convenient for you? What's, which do you prefer? So I'm going to give a, a little um, overview on a few things. And yeah. I guess when I finish my overview, if, if folks have questions, that would be a good time. And then John Thompson is going to uh, give an overview. And so at the end of his presentation, then I, um, that would be a good time to take take questions for his Great. portion. <laughs> And I think it's going to be particularly helpful. Um, one of the areas that I have not had as much um, experience in is the town's um, policy and authority to do inspections and examinations of residents and how that how that whole system works. Um, we rely upon, a lot upon the conditions you know, of the special permit being followed, and, and we really don't we don't have a role in enforcement. But that's done by the town, and John will talk about that um, in his presentation. So, Maureen, sure, get started. Okay. Um, okay. Um, all right. So, bear with me. Okay. So, um, uh, here is tonight's uh, presentation outline. I'll review the special permits uh, process um, and um, which is administered through the special permit granting authority and talk about um, decisions um, and conditions. And John Thompson will give an overview of the zoning code enforcement and we'll um, review um, typical conditions that we've used in the past uh, when permitting residential uses and uh, we'll talk about, um, we'll open it up for discussion um, of what works, what doesn't work, what, you know, if, if, if anything doesn't work, um, you know, do, does anyone have suggestions? Um, so, so special permits. Um, so uh, consistent with um, Mass General Law, Chapter 40A, Section 9, the Amherst Zoning Bylaw provides uh, for specific types of uses, uh, which can only be permitted in uh, uh, specific zoning districts upon the issuance of a special permit. Um, special permits may be uh, issued only for uses or structures which are in harmony with the general purpose and intent of the zoning bylaw. Um, the special permit uh, requires adjudication by the board and as such may be approved, approved with conditions or denied. Um, so the special permit granting authority, um, which uh, I'll, uh, is um, in Amherst, the special gran granting authority um, can be to, uh, uh, has, has um, can be either the planning board or the zoning board of appeals. So. Um, so again, uh, so for so for you, you guys, you are considered a special permit granting authority. Um, so uh, the ZBA has the discretionary power to consider a, an application, and this discretion may not be unguided, meaning it can't just be something completely random. Um, it has to be um, based on standards and criteria um, outlined in the zoning bylaw. So both you, the board, and the applicant are informed of what factors and considerations will govern the application. In order to be granted a special permit, the application needs to satisfy the following. Uh, the re relevant um, standards set forth under section 3.3, .3, the use classifications and standards. Table three, the dimensional regulations. Specific findings under section 10.38 and any other applicable requirements and standards under the zoning bylaw. Um, examples of resi uh, residential uses that are permitted by special permit and specified zoning districts include um, duplexes, um, either owner occupied duplex or a non-owner occupied duplex, townhouse apartments, 
converted dwelling, a mixed use building, and a detached accessory dwelling unit. And um, if it meets, um, if it is a certain size. And so um, in your leisurely time, um, I uh, would, uh, you could actually, we could click on it right now. Um, th this this uh, hyperlink will bring you to um, the town's GIS mapping tool, if it works. I've never seen it slow down like this, but um, what I was gonna say was, let's see here. This uh, is our, our GIS program. And um, if you click here, there's different uh, maps you can utilize. You, there's an aerial map, a topography map, property map, a zoning, a zoning map, and that's the one I'm, I'm clicking on. And you can you know, zoom in and um, see what areas of town are in, you know, um, in the various uh, zoning districts. And uh, so where you see the, the areas highlighted in yellow, those are the, the general uh, general residence districts. And hey, Maureen, um, sorry yes. to interrupt, but uh, we can, oh, you we can can't see, see the it. slide. Yeah, we can see <laughs> Thank it. Thank you. Yep, it's the way I did it. Sorry, Thank, I'm glad you said, glad, I'm glad that you said that. So um, the hyperlink from the, the slideshow brought us to this um, GIS mapping tool. And this is um, provided through the town. And when you click here, you can click on um, different types of maps, um, an aerial map, a topography map. And here I, I clicked on the zoning map. And, um, and so you can zoom in and zoom out. And here you can see where the yellow is. Um, you, you can see that it says RG and that represents the general zoning, uh, general residence zoning district. And if you click over here on the left side uh, where it says legend, you can find um, and scroll down, you can find uh, the legend that indicates the different zoning districts. So if you're sort of unclear of uh, what RG represents, um, this provides you like the full name, um, for instance. And then you also can search for properties. So we can just type in Adam Street. Um, and you can either, if you know the address, um, you could type in the, the exact address um, or you can just press search and then we can just, um, cl I clicked on this where it's now yellow and then show on map and it'll zoom right to that property, which is, uh, which is, I guess, a, pro a property. Um, and anyways, uh, you can see that it's, um, uh, located in the R and the neighborhood residence zoning district. Um, so that, I just wanted to give you a quick tutorial on that. And, um, and so now in the slideshow, it has a hyperlink to that, to that, um, that GIS mapping tool. Okay. So now I'm back on the slideshow and hopefully you see that. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool, cool. Okay, so, and then the next slide shows uh, table three, the dimensional regulations. Um, and so uh, we provide uh, dimensional regulations for each uh, zoning district. Um, and this is included in the zoning bylaw. And it gets into the lot, basic, basic minimum lot area, additional lot area per dwelling unit. Uh, basic minimum lot frontage, uh, setbacks, uh, front setback, side setback, rear setback, maximum building coverage, maximum, maximum lot coverage, maximum amount of floors allowed, and uh, maximum um, heights allowed per zoning district. Okay. And so the, as I said before, um, the uh, Amherst Zoning Bylaw designates the Zoning Board of Appeals and the Planning Board as the Special Permit Granting Authority. Um, the rules and regs, uh, were, um, so the state statute requires that um, the Planning Board and the ZBA adopt rules and regulations governing the, the organization procedures and, and conduct of the board and governing review and action on special permits, variances, appeals, and comprehensive permits. Tonight, we're just solely going to really be talking about special permits, but um, um, but there are um, other um, permits that the ZBA, for instance, handles, and those are variances, 
uh, appeals of a building commissioner decision in uh, comprehensive permits. A copy of the rules and regs are filed with the Amherst uh, town clerk. Um, so. Maureen, I would just add one thing, just for the new members, the ZBA rules and regs are something that we have, um, that, that we adopt as a body. And we, we, I think we most recently updated it in 2020, about a year ago. Um, but there are rules and there are the rules that we have adopted to govern the, the process of the, and the operation of the ZBA. Yep, good, very good point, Steve. Um, so the ZBA membership uh, consists of five regular members and four associate members. Um, all members uh, need to be residents of, the, of Amherst and they are appointed by the town council. Uh, regular members are expected to attend all regularly scheduled ZBA meetings, um, if possible. And the associate members um, sit on the board in case of absence, inability to act, or um, there is an apparent conflict of interest on the part of any ZBA member, or in the event of a vacancy of the, re of the regular membership. Application filing. So applicants are required to uh, meet with the building commissioner or planner to complete the application for a special permit prior to filing it with the town clerk. Um, this is an important uh, step because um, it gives a chance for staff to meet with the applicant to make sure that everything they provided is, um, is complete. And, um, and so sometimes uh, things um, we notice that are, oh, you, you forgot either a couple things or you forgot a lot of things and, um, and, and that are a requirement of the application. And so, um, you know, staff will review this with the applicant. And once um, it is deemed complete by the building commissioner, Rob will sign off on the application and then uh, we uh, will file it with the town clerk, and that's when we then will schedule a public hearing with, with the board. Um, the public hearing and decision. So the special permit granting authority, so again, that could be the ZBA or the planning board, um, needs to hold a public hearing with, with notice, um, so uh, provided um, with a legal ad going into the Daily Hampshire Gazette, that um, public legal ad um, needs to be advertised twice, two weeks, and one week before the meeting, which it spells out what the application entails, and it says uh, the date and time and the Zoom link, um, so members of the public know about the public hearing, and also abutters that uh, have properties within 300 feet of the project site get notified by regular mail. So the public hearing needs to be held within 65 days of the filing of the application with the town clerk. Um, and the ZBA uh, needs to take action and, um, and make their decision um, within nine, um, uh, which uh, take final action uh, making and filing the decision with the town clerk within 90 days of the close of the public hearing. Um, and these timelines can be extended uh, with um, written agreement between the applicant and, and the board. Uh, voting requirements. So uh, for a special permit, uh, it, uh, again, that's what we're kind of just focusing on tonight. Um, the decision, um, so a special permit um, approval or denial, um, uh, well, I guess a approval, you would need at least four members uh, four members uh, to vote uh, in favor of a special of a special permit for it to be uh, approved, um, and uh, for um, a comprehensive permit, which is something completely different, you just uh, need three members of of a five member board to vote in favor of it for to approve. So that's just a comparison. Uh, a withdrawal. So an applicant can withdraw an application. Um, and uh, if, if it's, um, there's two sort of avenues before the legal ad is published in the Daily Hampshire Gazette, Gazette the applicant could say, you know what, actually, um, I would just like to withdraw my application. He can, that person could just um, send me a formal email or, or letter uh, addressing it to the ZBA and I just need to file it with the town clerk. 
if it's after the legal ad is published in the paper, then the applicant needs to formally request it, request a uh, withdrawal without prejudice um, to the ZBA at a meeting. And um, the board would need to um, vote on that either yes or no. And so the, um, the board uh, would needs for decision-making, the board needs to make a detailed record of its proceedings, including the vote of each member on each application, including the failure to vote, the absence of a member and the reasons for its decisions and actions. Um, the board needs to make uh, findings um, that um, support the decision or actions that, and the findings are, you know, AKA the reasons why why the board either you know approved or denied a, a, a permit, um, and those findings are based on the zoning bylaw, um, and uh, and the applicable um, sections in the zoning bylaw, um, and and these bullets highlight you know those um, those uh, standards. So you know the the standards under that particular use. Um, and the dimensional regulations and the specific findings under section 10.38 uh, and any other applicable requirement or standard under the bylaw. I feel like I might have said some of this before. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, after the board signs the decision and it's filed with the town clerk, there is a 20 day appeal period. Um, and so um, so, um, you know, butters that have, I forget the term, interest, uh, the, the butters that are within 300 feet of the property could, if they had an issue with the project, they could um, possibly appeal it, it in superior court. And after that 20 day appeal period is over and there is no appeal, um, then then the that applicant is, is ready to move forward with their building permit or whatever else is needed. Um, so the uh, the board um, is is able under you know Mass General Law to impose conditions, safeguards, and limitations on time and use of any structure or use for which a special permit is sought. For example, a requirement that limits the special permit to the applicant or owner is ex is an acceptable condition. Um, and you know you guys make conditions. Um, I, I think ninety nine if not 100% of the time when approving a special permit. Um, in addition, when a special permit application is accompanied by plans or designs, those become conditions of the special permit and the board should so uh, specify in its decision. It's important that the decision with conditions are clear and well-written, which are based on the relevant findings made in order for it to be defensible in a potential appeal um, at Superior Court. And so, um, they're also enforceable by the town uh, enforcement um, officers, such as John Thompson. Um, and so a special permit requires the adjudication of the board. Um, I, I did say this before, and as such uh, may be approved, approved with conditions or denied. There is no guarantee or entitlement to a special permit. Um, the board may deny the permit based on any reasonable grounds. Um, the, the planning department encourage, encourages the board to provide detailed findings for denial of a special permit. And, you know, if there is a denial, it, again, it really should be based on findings, relevant findings under the zoning bylaw. It's not because you don't like a person or just for some sort of random reason. It really needs to point back to the, the findings that you made under the zoning bylaw. And I already said that. And so now I'm gonna pass, oh, oh, before I pass the baton over to John Thompson, um, do you have any questions? Uh, yes. Go ahead. Uh, I just was trying to remember the, the four votes uh, for special permits. That was something that we had adopted in our rules when we, um, we voted that back in 2020. That's not something uh, coming down from state law or town bylaw. Is that? That is based on mass state general state. law. Yeah. That's, that's a, uh, under chapter 48, I think, right? 
mm -hmm. yeah. outlines it throughout the state the same yeah the major, uh, super majority requirement uh, mr meadows um uh, either a simple or a difficult question um under the the guidance document um proposed activity requiring a special permit will ha uh will be evaluated assuming that there are no adverse impacts. I'm not certain what adverse impacts relates to. Uh, I mean, it could be adverse impacts to um, the neighbors, um, to the property itself. Um, I don't know exactly where you're reading that, but that would be you know, an example of an adverse impact. Um, if there is, you know, for instance, um, a, 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 some sort of development and they have parking and there is no screening provided and the applicant is just saying, you know what, I still don't, the neighbors have expressed that they want screening to block the, the headlights from the cars that park on this proposed development. But you know what, I, they, they, the hypothetical is that maybe they still don't care. They still don't want to provide fencing or you know evergreen shrubbery that could easily block that um the headlights and so you know that that could be a reasonable um that could be a finding that you, you as the board couldn't make under 10.38 um that there would be an adverse impact to that neighbor or neighbors um and so that could be a, a reason to deny a permit you would you would hope that the the, the applicant would be reasonable and say, sure, I'll provide privacy fencing. That seems to make sense. And then you would be able to make that finding. So it's just, so, oh, it's just a broad category. OK. So mm -hmm. if you look at when you look at 10.38, a lot of those are just about um, the effect that the special permit will have on the neighborhood or the community or mm -hmm. the conservation district or other things. And if we can't find that the that we meet the requirements, make a finding that we meet the requirements of all of 10.38, then that's grounds for denial of a special permit. Is that correct, Maureen? Yeah, yep, yep. And you so have, you have to usually, make findings on all of those. Yeah. Right? And so the way that you can, you know, make those findings is uh, is with the inclusion of conditions. So a condition to say in that hypothetical is that, you know, vegetative screening will be provided and maintained for the life of that project. Um, so if there was, you know, and, you know, if there was a concern about adverse effect of that neighbor or neighbors, um, that would be a, a good, good condition to include. So you could make okay. that. So it, it's, it's similar to the, to Article three, where it says um, permits may be issued for only uses which are in harmony with the general purpose. In harmony is a pretty broad spectrum of concepts. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay. Yep. Ms. Parks. So I'm just wondering um, if there's any cost to talk to to the planning board or someone in town, if you just want to think about a project at your house, is there only a, the, the does a cost only take place when you're actually doing permits? Uh, so, it, the, it, if I'm hearing you, so your question is: Are there only costs associated with um, you know the application fee for the special permit? Yeah, and are there other costs? Yeah, so I mean. So yeah, they'll, there is a fee associated with the application and, um, and then there is a fee to record the uh, permit with the registry of deeds. And then if there's needed building permits and, or electrical permits, stuff of that nature, there would be additional per, um, fees associated. But as far oh. as like just talking to the town and- No, no, there is no fees, fees. nope. Okay. No, we generally meet with people very often to discuss their first before they even outlay any kind of money or, or application. So we just want to make sure that it's even feasible to begin with. Yeah. And 
and we'll guide them down that road. That's what yeah. I was hoping. I just, I just didn't know if there was like a consultation fee or anything like that. Yeah. Or yeah, no, know. Nope. Actually, yeah. Actually, just the yesterday, Dave Weskevitz and I met with someone, and I and um, someone had called me up, and I said they said, oh, we have these plans to do, you know, A, B, and C, and on our property, and. I said, oh, you're gonna have to get a, you know, a surveyor to survey your property. But I said, you know what, before you go hire that surveyor, why don't you meet with Dave and I and we'll see if this is even feasible. So uh, we met with them yesterday, I believe, just to kind of yep. walk them through the process. And, and they, 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 it was very helpful for them because um, you know, th there was some information that they didn't realize. Um, and so um, that'll help them decide whether they want to pursue it or not um so yeah so that people people call us all the time and you know we can meet via phone zoom and and now in person so yeah there was a project a couple of days ago which will probably come before the board if they decide to go forward but it was two units existing or actually one or yeah two and they were conceivably adding a third and maybe a fourth so that would be something we would just tell them what they need to look at first to see if it's feasible. Ex uh, try to explain some of the costs they might in, uh, run into building code wise, and then decide if they want to do two, three, or four units. But that's a typical day for us, <laughs> among other things. I guess I'd like to just stress one one more time, I know you've heard me say this before, but the, the imposition of conditions is sometimes the, um, the grease that makes the gears work for the benefit of both the applicant as well as the surrounding neighbors. We have to make a decision on 18, we have 18 findings under 10.38. If they are applicable to this case, we've got to make a finding in each one of those that we meet those uh, the requirements of those of that section of the bylaw. And sometimes we can't. There are times when we can't make that finding for to use Maureen's example. We can't make the finding under one of our requirements that it will not impose a burden on the neighbor to have the the lights shining into their bedrooms every time the car comes in and out without having some kind of screening or vegetation. And if put by putting a condition on that application saying it can be approved if there is screening to prevent the intrusion of headlights into the neighboring houses, then, the, then we can make that finding and the, and the, um, the application can go forward, if, if, assuming that all other findings are met. But if we can't make that finding and the, and the um, applicant refuses to do that, then we, we can't make the finding that we need to make in order to, to approve the special permit. And that's how conditions work both to the benefit, can work to the benefit of the applicant, as well as can resolve concerns and problems that the neighbors or the community has about the property. Uh, and it isn't just, it isn't just uh, limited to neighbors, it's also limited, it also applies to the conservation districts and other kinds of broader concerns and just the next door neighbor that we have to make findings that this development or this change, a special permit will not uh, pollute the water or um, uh, pollute the light sources and other things. So, and it has to be consistent with the, uh, the general town plan, the master plan. So those are, those are one of the reasons that conditions are imposed. That's how they tend to work in, in I think in our experience and they have been beneficial to the, to, to both applicants as well as to the town and to the residents of the town. All right, Maureen, is that pretty much what you wanted to go through? Yep. So next, uh, so we'll yeah. now pass the baton to John. So uh, John, I can, um, I can, Click on the slides. Um, so, right, stay on the first slide for a minute, Maureen. Mm -hmm. Go back one. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I'm John Thompson. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself and how I got to this job. Um, 
I worked in the Valley as a carpenter and a custom home builder for 38 years. Um, during that time, I served on my local planning board for 15 years, um, seven as the chair, and I served for 10 years on my local ZBA. So I um, had an understanding of uh, both how um, zoning bylaws are written and how they're enforced before I um, came to this job working for the town. In 2012, the town of Amherst um, advertised a job that hadn't existed before, which would be someone, they wanted to hire someone to be a building inspector and a health inspector who could um, uh, work on health and safety issues in the um, rental community. And um, there's about 5,000 units of rental, uh, you know, rental units in Amherst. So it's, so it's, a, it's a big job. Um, it sounded interesting to me because it, it hadn't existed. And, um, you know, I applied and, and um, got the job. So got to help create it. Um, Rob came on um, right about the same time that I started. And so we, um, we started to, to form the team that, that we have now. Um, go ahead, Maureen, and we'll talk about some of the, um, the most common complaints and and, and enforcements that I deal with. Um, some of these are just things that I drive by. Some of them are, are things that neighbors complain about. Um, you know, trash, you can see the problem here. Um, there was too much trash on the site. It looks like animals got into it. Uh, it gets spread around. Um, this is just one that I happen to drive by. Um, most of these in terms of enforcement, um, I know who, because I've been doing this long enough, I know who owns the property. Um, I have them in my cell. I, I take a photo of this. I text it to them. I say, you know, clean it up by noon and, and it happens. Um, a lot of these little um, complaints are, are handled same day. Um, go ahead, Maureen, and click to the next one. Again, uh, a trash thing. So this upsets neighbors to no end. These kids had a party and they didn't put their toys away. And on Monday morning, I hear about it. Next slide. So vehicles, um, you know, people complain about parking and I see parking when I drive around. I, I took this photo the other day. This is a house um, down on um, McClure Street. McClure. Yeah, I walked past this house. Yeah, so there's two cars on the lawn. Um, there were there's another photo that I had taken. There's two more cars on the front lawn. So we had one, two, three, four, five, six cars there. there there's a zoning bylaw in Amherst that no more than four unrelated can live in a single family home. And, um, you know, we got six cars. I'm not sure how, how that's going, but um, I can talk about, after we get through the slides, I'll talk about how we, um, how we deal with enforcement on something like this. Go ahead, Maureen, to the next slide. So this is uh, two photos of, of an unusual property on Cosby Street, which is off of Lincoln. There's two houses on, on a single lot. They're both listed as four bedroom homes. There are 11 cars parked there on this particular day. And I've actually seen 12 cars there. Um, so we got two problems. We got the parking problem and we've got, a, um, we've got an overpopulation probably happening. And, and Maureen pointed out to me, they actually, go back to that slide, they actually have a, a, an approved parking plan that shows 11 cars. It's a hand-drawn thing. I, I tried it today. I drew one um, on the town GIS. And if you fit 11 cars in there, it's, it's like that little parking lot game that you get on your phone, you know, where you got to figure out how to, how to move a car so you can get the other one out. No, it's just, it's just not happening. And, and of course, uh, an emergency vehicle has... If, if, if this is full of cars like this, they can't get in there. So that's, that's a problem. Click on Maureen. This one just happened the other day. So what happens when we have an overpopulated house and they're all out on the deck at one o'clock in the morning? Um, you know, we had a deck collapse. Nobody, nobody was injured in this one, um, fortunately, but that's the second egress to the house right back there. They can't use that anymore. So now we've got another situation. If, you know, how do they get out? Um, fortunately, the next morning, uh, they were there tearing down what was remained of the deck and they put up some temporary stairs to, to be able to access that door again. 
I think that's it. Did I, is that all I put in for slides? Yes. So um, I can talk about enforcement a little bit. Um, so complaints come in a few different ways. People can complain online. We have an electronic way to do that. And um, folks use that for all kinds of complaints, not just housing complaints, although it is on the um, rental page um, specifically. But um, a few, a few different people see those complaints. Often noise complaints will get filed that way. You know, one o'clock in the morning, someone goes online and files one of those. I don't see that, of course, until Monday morning. But um, Officer Laramie, who is the neighborhood liaison officer for APD, he gets a copy of these complaints and we review them on Monday and, and deal with them then. Um, people call me and leave a message. People email me directly and leave messages. Um, so if we get a complaint, as say it's a uh, say it's a parking complaint at a at a property, um, I will go there, um, you know, get a photo of the the problem, um, uh, reach out to the landlord. Um, the landlords will have any number of excuses. That's just their girlfriends, uh, you know, whatever, whatever. Um, but we got to deal with the problem. Um, often it's pretty easy to. Uh, arrive at a solution. Sometimes what I what I'll do if it's if it's a problem that people have been complaining about for a while is um, we'll we'll go there every morning and and um, keep track of which cars we see. So um, you know there's 10 cars there every day. It's the same 10 cars. Um, I'll I'll request a copy of the lease with um, the names of the occupants and then um, a list of which cars I'm supposed to see and what their what their plate numbers are and um, and then we can go and say okay well what about these other you know what about these cars because these don't seem to belong to anybody um, and if it's an overpopulation we'll um, we'll lean on the landlord to to address that there's language in the rental bylaw that um, you know we can suspend their rental permit um, if need be usually landlords are pretty compliant uh, that's been my experience with them um, landlords that aren't compliant we have a, uh, a way to find them um, we can we can we can um, write a non-criminal disposition ticket that's like a parking ticket so it's a hundred dollars per violation you know if I if I see a house like that on McClure where there's four vehicles on the lawn, that's four violations. That's a, that's $400 a day. So uh, for every day that I see that, um, they get 21 days to pay that ticket. If it doesn't get paid, uh, we go to district court and the magistrate hears the case and, and um, you know, we'll uh, listen to both sides and then make a judgment. Uh, how else? Uh, but Mr. Thompson, um, yeah. you don't have, you have, you need to get a complaint, you know, for, in, in, for overcrowding, for example, I mean, parking, you can see that, but just driving by, if, if you, if you have a, a house that is, or a, that only allows for four people, uh, four unrelated individuals, there is no way for you to independently investigate whether you can go in and to that house and look at it and say, well, I, I think there's six people living in this house or, or 10, whatever it is, you need to have a complaint in order to do that. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, kind of. Mostly, yes, I would say. The bylaw, the rental bylaw allows me to um, request an inspection of, of a property. So, you know, I did one the other day. There's a house that's um, become a rental recently on Jeffrey Lane, and the neighbors are, you know, watching it like hawks. And, um, well, um, you know, there's six cars there, John. There's six cars. Here's photos of the six cars. Um, the kind, the times that I've seen, it's only been four cars, but I've had enough complaints about it that I requested an inspection. So the bylaw says within 24 hours, I can walk through the house. So um, I did that um, two days ago. We walked through the house and, um, you know, there's four bedrooms and um, there were four beds. And then we went down in the garage and behind a couple sheets of plywood, there was another bed. Oh, that's just a, um, that's just being stored there, you know, with the sheets on it. Um, sure it is. Uh, <laughs> that looks like it came out of the room that has a TV in it. You know, that's bedroom number five. So 
yeah, that landlord's got some explaining to do. And um, while I'm in the house, you know, I, I make a, a short list of other violations that need to get addressed. So, you know, two of the smoke detectors don't work and one of them fell down out of the ceiling when I pressed the button um, like that. Um, so she'll be given a period of time to address this. Um, what she came away with was, wow, I got to keep a closer eye on this house because, um, you know, when I, she said, when I see it, 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 it's looked fine, but I'm, I'm not really driving by it all that often. And I said, you know, the management's really got to be up to you. I can't be managing the property for you and the neighbors aren't managing it either. So, um, she picks up her daughter at the Montessori school and Jeffrey Lane's right on her way. She can, she can stop by there once a week and take a look at it. And so that's what we agreed will happen. John, could you talk about, um, you know, the importance of conditions? Um, Boy, you know, I, I, both from my experience as a ZBA member and um, in the job that I'm in now, the conditions are where you have all your power. Um, I don't remember really ever denying a special permit application when I was a ZBA member here in Shutesbury, but boy, we, um, we did condition them. Um, I was thinking when, you, when the, the question was asked earlier about, you know, adverse um, effects, we have uh, Lake Wyola here in town, and, and it's, a, it's, it's popular for folks right on the front line of the lake to want to put a second story on their house. But that has, of course, an adve adverse effect on the house right behind it. They can't see the lake anymore. So um, we did use, use that um, as reason to um, lower the roof line. Yeah, you, maybe you can add something onto your house, but maybe not a full second, full second story, you know? Um, and that actually was the one of the advantages of having a builder on the ZBA was uh, clients can't say, well, you know, we, there's, it's not possible to do that. Yeah, it might be possible to do it two or three different ways. Um, I think that both both from your point of view, your power is in the conditions, but it's also it helps us in the enforcement because, um, you know, we can go then back to those conditions and we have something to enforce. And so the, you know, there, there must be uh, residential homes out there that are, you know, either owner occupied or their rentals and they don't, and they're like maybe just pre-existing non-conforming houses that never needed a special permit. And so they don't have any conditions. Um, what do you, um, is it, sort of um, difficult to enforce that, uh, you know, if there are no conditions, if there's something, you know, something uh, that you wish you, there could be a condition to address it, um, but there isn't, is there, I don't know, do you have any thoughts on that of how, how do you deal with per, uh, properties that don't have conditions? Do you find it, um, you know, you know we still we still have the building code, the sanitary code and and other zoning. So, um, you know, I have I have other tools available. It's just that if the if the conditions are written down, here's the thing. These houses, this this is um, this is more and more in demand. People want to uh, figure out how to keep their house one way or another. Or they want to uh, figure out how their house can make some income for them or maybe they're buying the house and they want the income property to help pay the mortgage. Um, I, I think that we're seeing more and more houses um, need these special permits. So the more um, the more we can control what happens to them, the, the, e the easier it is on the neighbors and, and the town as a whole, I think. But I guess, just to clarify, if you have an existing non-conforming use someplace um, and it doesn't have a special permit. And to use Maureen's example of light trespass onto the neighbors, there is no way for you, or, and there's because it's, there's not a special permit, there is no way for the town to say, you must put up screening to prevent the lights from entering your bedroom every night. Yeah, not um, really. And I do get complaints just, about that. My yeah, neighbor put up a spotlight and it shines in my bedroom. You can make them stop. But you can't do anything about that without a no, special permit. And that's correct. Because it hasn't, it isn't a health and safety violation. It isn't a building code violation. So there's 
So in that case, there's nothing that can be done. But if, if they are requesting a special permit in, and in effect, they're saying, we wanna be able to do something that would otherwise not be allowed to be done, there, and the ZBA can say that's that's right. We think what you want to do is a good thing. We generally think it's a good idea, but here are the conditions that we think will make this acceptable for the neighborhood or make it acceptable for the town. And that's what the purpose of the conditions are. That's right. So, okay. Are there other questions for, for John? I guess the one thing I don't know very much about um, Mr. Thompson is the the rental the is it the residential rental permit program and what that does. I know that has you have to sign up for it. You have to get a you have to get a permit. You have to pay a, a small fee to have rental property, and you need to have some kind of a parking plan. But I don't know much more than that about the residential rental uh, permit process. I'll talk about it for a minute. Um, so. Um... The one of the one of the um, difficulties I encountered right away when I started doing this job was that um, many properties in town were not owned by people who lived in town, and um, uh, often they didn't even live in Massachusetts or or, or in the United States. Um, you know, they lived in Spain or uh, in China. Um, so there was, if there was an issue at a house, I I really had to be a be a, do quite a bit of investigation to figure out how to get in touch with them um and that and that ate up a lot of time we needed we needed a database of you know who owned the house how do we get in touch with you in an emergency and um so the the town set up a a, um, a team of uh, both uh town hall staff um folks uh, landlords, um, tenants, folks from the university who um, hammered out this um, rental bylaw. And one of the requirements is that you need to apply for a permit every year. It's $100. It, it comes due on July 1st. Um, and the rental permit needs to be displayed on the premises. So the tenants know how to get in touch with someone and um, fire when they go there in an emergency, um, can read how to get in touch with the owner quickly. Um, and I know how to get in touch with you when your um, deck collapses. Um, so um, I think it's been pretty successful. Um, we, we've, uh, the town's just rolled out some new software, which is gonna make it even more successful because we're gonna know um, when you didn't renew your permit, which which was a shortcoming of the way we were doing it previously. Um, we'll be able to capture everybody in this, but it, one of the um, requirements of that program is that you need to have a local agent and that's somebody who lives within 20 miles. So, so in an emergency, I can get somebody to come there right away. If it's two o'clock in the morning and we've got a deck collapse, um, I can get someone to show up there. And for the rental permit, um, I know that you need to have a parking plan. So you and need how to. Does that, um, how does that, if, if you have a special permit on that property and you're going to have a residential, a residential rental parking plan, how do those two mesh? So the, um, the zoning, uh, chapter seven of the zoning bylaw uh, talks all about parking and, and um, you know, um, how big a, a parking space is it's nine by 18 so and and how many spaces do you need per unit that kind of language is all in there um the parking plans that they draw um need to show that they can fit those cars on their property so this is really um in in terms of of a lot of the rental properties in town it's aimed at single family homes which you know had typically a car or um, two cars. Uh, they didn't have four cars and they certainly didn't have six cars because they don't have driveways for that. So what we want to see is, can this site accommodate this use? Um, and that's, and that's where your conditioning will be, you know, really key here. Um, 
you've got you've got two units you've got eight bedrooms you're going to have eight cars what about um, a couple of guest cars are they going to how are you going to accommodate those on the site and not you know pave the whole yard and um and have headlights in the neighbor's yard and yeah it's a it's a bit of a um it's a bit of a juggle on some of these sites I want to make sure that everybody, anybody else who has questions, um, gets a chance to ask them. Ms. Winter, um, go ahead. I have a question for me. If, if uh, a single family, such as, for example, my family, if I wanted to rent out a room in my house, a room to a student, do I have to apply for one of these rental permits and pay a hundred dollars a year? That I'm not sure that's very well known if that's the case. No, or is that something you just do? There's actually an exemption. So you anybody in town is allowed to rent three bedrooms in their home without having a rental permit. So that's that's you know, somebody's using your kitchen, they're they're using your bathroom. Um and there's like a member of your family, but they're but they're in one of your extra rooms uh, because that's right. pretty common in town. Um, you know that that exists oh. all over the place. Yeah. Okay. Thank it you. didn't it didn't seem fair to charge a hundred bucks for that. But you also haven't created a new, you haven't created a new dwelling unit. Is is the point there, right? Yes. Um, because you were the existing dwelling unit, the, the kitchen, the bathroom, everything else is being used for the three renters and what, as well as the owner. But if you were creating a new um, a new dwelling unit, a new kitchen, new bathroom to accommodate uh, the renters, then you would need a, a renter permit. The vehicles might be a thing, though. You know, um, depending yeah. on the depending on the property. Good question. I wanted to see, uh, does uh, Dave or Rob have anything to add or? Yeah, the only thing I can think of is I can recall a house um, because the yard really didn't have any room for all the cars that would be expected with the number of tenants. They had a, a condition that limited the cars to say two cars where they probably needed four. Um, but that was also known to the tenants before they rented. That was part of the lease um, agreement that they would understand that only two would be allowed and then they would have to figure out who that would be. But, you know, that was a, a case where conditions can sometimes come into being and it addresses some of these problems. And that's true. Um, certainly you're aware of it downtown. Um, you know, folks, folks are, um, particularly aggravated about new buildings going up that don't provide any parking, but there's, there's buildings all up and down main street, and North pleasant street, you know, up above those businesses that, that have apartments in them that don't provide any parking. It's not unusual in a downtown situation, not to have parking that goes with your apartment. Mr. Maxfield. My question is um, <clears throat> about mentioning making kind of a database of all the um, numbers and contact information for, for landlords and stuff like that. Do we have, or is there a database of just special permits that have been issued in town? Or if you're looking at a property, how do you know whether or not it has a uh, special permit attached to it? That's a great question. So the GIS um, tool that I showed you online, um, I could pull it up um, if that's helpful. Should I pull it? Okay, let's just pull it up. Yeah, right that'd, be, that'd be very helpful, Maureen. It's good. It is a good question. Um, excellent question, Dylan. Okay, so give me a second. Um, X out of that, go like that. Okay, so... Let's see here. Hmm. What address should I pick? Um, so 11, 11 Phillips. 
Yeah. Okay, yeah. I'm gonna, so I'm going to start over again. So, uh, so this is what it looks like when you first go to the screen for the GIS. So we're going to press uh, go to search to the left, and we're going to go uh, Phillips three. You said 15? 11. fifteen. Eleven. Oh no, which eleven? Sorry. Okay. And so um, now the map highlights that property for 11, 11 Phillips Street. And then if you go to the right side of the screen um, where I'm sort of clicking down, there's options. Um, so this, this um, pr uh, where it says property information, it, uh, this shows like who owns it, what, what's, you know, um, zoning districts, the size of the property. And then um, the you can click on each year's uh, assessor's property card, and um, there's like other information here. But for we're going to click on um, this little tab here and go to permitting and complaint history. And um, oh, look at all so the complaints! It, so you can see there's a lot of complaints, and so when I actually provide um, the board. Um, in my project application report, if I find that there's complaints listed uh, and I put it in the report, this is where I get this information. And I, I, I literally just cut and paste it from here. Um, and so you can see, yeah, there's, there's a lot of complaints. Look at this, it just keeps, keeps going. Okay. So, um, and so now um, the next, so the sequence is it goes through the complaints and then the next section is about rental permits. And if you click here, um, this brings you to our new um, software, it's called OpenGov. And that's where you can look up what the permit history, uh, uh, the rental permits are for the property. The most recent uh, permits, the older mm -hmm. ones are right there and yeah, still in you. GIS. Yep, yep, yeah, yeah. So actually let's click on this one. Hey, Maureen, can you drop to the bottom just to see if there's any zoning permits against this property? Yeah, go all the yep. way down. Oh, way oh down. yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so let's just go to that. Okay. Um, yeah, so you can just see there's uh, rental permits per year, and um, you can click on the permit and the parking plan for each of the years. And then um, and then now this gets into, it looks like uh, maybe like building permits and stuff. Um, and so now we're just going to scroll. Let's just scroll all the way down. Ooh. So that's where, so... Um, if you do this on your own and you're looking for ZBA permits, just go to this tab and then scroll all the way down, and that it goes into um, or, or chronicle uh, chronological order. Um, uh, let's see here. So I think this might be the latest one or the last one issued in 1990. Uh, it was under review. Um, hmm, under review, Bernard. Dorothy to modify special permit 1988-52, which would allow one, a transfer of ownership from Bernard to somebody else. Yeah, it's right below it right there. That's 2005. Oh, thank you. Okay, so this is yeah. the latest one. So anyways, um, so this uh, shows you the different special permits related for this property. So it looks like actually the latest special permit is from 2006. Six, yeah. um, and then so you can just go through it, um, the special permit. And so these are, you know, this is what you sign off on for special permit decisions. And so got this any gets conditions? In. Let's see, let's see what it's got yeah. for conditions. Very likely. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I uh, picked a hot one here. Oh, wait, oh, yeah. oh I don't, but did you though? No. I don't see it. Wait, no. hold on. Wait. Uh, it could be. <laughs> Was this a... The deny, oh, they denied the application. Yeah, that's why no conditions. Yeah, yeah no conditions. Okay, so let's let's find the, give you guys a reference. Here's one from 1990. And so, yeah, usually it's the first page of the special permit decision. Um, if it's approved, um, we'll list the, the motion and, and the conditions. So you can see there's nine, there's nine conditions related to this property. Yeah, it looks like it was a sorority. It was at one time, yes. Yeah. So yeah. So to answer your question, Dylan, that is how you can find um, 
uh, decisions uh, through the ZBA. Another way of finding um, condition, uh, decisions is going to the Registry of Deeds, um, the Hampshire County Registry of Deeds, and, and looking up um, a property. But this is usually a, a um, you know a faster way of going about it. And I wouldn't expect all of the special permits to be listed there because sometimes they're not. They may go back quite a ways or but the registry is another way to double check to make sure you didn't miss any. Occasionally somebody gets a special permit and they forget to register it at the registry of deeds. That's their final step. Um, and we, we do find that that happens sometimes. So that would be a special permit that's really not in effect because they didn't complete the task. But that's not likely to happen during these, these times because we make sure that they've registered before they're getting any building permits, before they even get to occupy or whatever they're gonna be doing with the property. Yeah. Okay. All right. So uh, any other comments from staff uh, about enforcement or the zoning bylaw in general before we um, move on to the conditions or? Ms. Parks. So, so do you prefer that, how do you prefer people put in a complaint? I mean, um, what I have done in the past is called the landlord or called, uh, I, I know Eagle Crest, I don't, uh, I guess property management. Um, what, how, what's the best way? We can't hear you, John. Muted. Sorry, I'm happy for you to do it that way. And I actually, I wish more people would would get involved in that, um, that way. You know, if you're having a problem with your neighbor's trash, talk to your neighbor. Um, a lot of people would rather I be the heavy there. Um, and, and, I, and I get that. Um, I, I guess I don't have a preference. I mean, you can, call, you can call me, you can email me, or you can do it as an electronic complaint. The, the frustration I have with some of the electronic complaints is that the complainer um, would like to remain anonymous. And so when I, when I can't do anything for you, I have no way of telling you. So um, I, I feel like then folks think, well, see that I complained and they didn't do anything. Uh, there was a reason I didn't do anything, but I can't, I can't tell you what that reason is because I don't know who you are. I, I just didn't know if you would want to keep a record of it. Like if, if I were to call Eagle Crest, do you want me to also send an email to you and say, by the way, I'm calling Eagle Crest for the third time about what? Yeah, or if a, a lot of times folks will, folks will, you know, copy me on an email that they're emailing Eagle Crest. Okay. I just didn't know if you wanted to have a log of those complaints. <laughs> Not that you need more things to do, but. I have a lot of logs. I got plenty of logs. Okay. <laughs> but the question, you know, if, if you're in a house and the, um, the house across the street has numerous, car, too many cars that are parking on the lawn and the garbage is, is not getting picked up. Um, you don't know how to contact, you can one walk across the street and knock on the door and you, and I think a case that I can remember personally, you can walk across the street, knock on the door, and you've got 15 tenants living in the building, and you don't know who to talk to. But unless you have the notice from the complaint response form or someplace in town, you don't know who to call as the owner. If your first step is you want to avoid the conflict by bringing the town into the into the um, matter, but you want to try to handle it on your own, how do you do that? You have to, there has to be some way that either the neighbors are, are informed or it, you can look it up in the town and say, I want to call Eagle Crest because they're the management company. How does it, how does that happen? You know, the, the part of the point of, of the um, printed rental permit, those are available online. Anybody can look those up and that information is on them. So you got an email contact and you've got a phone number. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say it's right on the rental registration. If you go into the GIS, you can look at that information. So that big white house across the street, Tammy, <laughs> you know, can, could was could be a real problem. Um, and when I was new to town, I didn't know how to 
how to express my concern and see if it could be fixed. And now I understand that there is a way to do that and it's all online, okay? Yeah, that was my, I mean, we're talking about the same house, but that I, yeah. I, I went, when they were working on the house, I, I went out and asked for contact information. Um, but also, I mean, that, that another issue that was there was Lincoln Avenue, was people parking on Lincoln Avenue and trying to figure out whether that should be allowed, you know, parking on Lincoln Avenue on either side, because occasionally people were parked on both sides of Lincoln Avenue, which then closes the street off. Yeah. <laughs> Are there other? Go, go ahead. Somebody's going to speak. I was going to weigh in about about Lincoln Avenue with an anecdote. So I I'm, I've been around long enough that I remember when um, speed of cars on Lincoln Avenue was an issue, and and the neighbors wanted those cars slowed down. So they got some speed bumps and they got some parking, and you'd be hard pressed to speed on Lincoln Avenue anymore. Um, you know, you have to creep down the street. Uh, be careful what you ask for, I guess. Are there other questions um, before we go on to uh, review some conditions, look at kind of typical conditions we've had in the past um, and we, that we've typically imposed? And I just want to make sure that everybody's familiar with these before we, but before that, uh, this is a chance to learn more about how enforcement works, how the rental, rental permit process works and sort of the the um, boundaries within which the ZBA has to operate in order to make its findings, in order to make a decision to grant a special permit. All right, before we go, I would just encourage everybody to read. Um, I would encourage you to go to your zoning bylaws, the zoning bylaw and read 10.38. That kind of gives us, it gives you a very good background on the kinds of basis is for which we have to make our decisions and the findings we have to make. Um, I just really encourage everybody to do that. If there's one thing you should be familiar with on the board, it's 10.38. Okay, there's no questions. Let's go on more into the next segment. Okay. Uh, sure. Um, so before I actually go on to the conditions, I just wanted to, sh um, I don't wanna forget about this. So at the end mm -hmm. of the slideshow, I provide um, some resources, um, link resources. So at your leisure, you can, you know, uh, refer to this. Um, the first one is uh, Mass General Law, Chapter 40. Um, I guess I in um, um, Section 9 is, uh, uh, is in particular, is uh, talks about uh, the special permit granting authority and your, you know, sort of your purview. Um, so that, that's um, something that you could review. Number two is um, the um, zoning, the Amherst zoning bylaw. Uh, number three is the zoning, the ZBA rules and regulations. That's really helpful. I, I definitely recommend everyone to review that specifically um, and review the zoning bylaw as um, each application comes by. Um, and so on the agenda, the, the application um, being heard will list every applicable zoning bylaw section that needs to uh, be reviewed and uh, specific findings need to be made. So when you are looking at the zoning bylaw, it'd be, um, you could refer to the agenda or the application that will list each of those um, applicable sections and look at that. And so over time, you'll get uh, more and more familiar with um, the bylaw. Um, number four is the ZBA webpage. There's tons of information on there and different links. And that's where the ZBA application is listed. Um, and so that's uh, a really useful um, you know, document to refer to if you haven't already. Number five is the Amherst zoning map. And so that was the map that I um, was uh, showing you earlier um, and has tons of um, great information on there. And then um, on the next page is um, what John Thompson was talking about the rent, the residential rental permit, property permit uh, uh, program with the town. That's a link to that which has lots of information um, regarding our rental program. And number seven, this is the complaint, uh, property complaint form. Um, this is the form to submit a complaint about a property, including properties containing rental units. So that would be the, the link 
um, that you would use to make a complaint if you had one. And, and, and that would go to John. <laughs> um, and so now um, let me click here. This will bring us to uh, the conditions. Can you see this? It's better. Yeah, yeah okay, cool. Um, okay, and so I broke, um, broke down the conditions. Um, so these are conditions that the board has used um, for dwelling units um, that require a special permit. Um, I have tweaked them, uh, the wording of some of them, and I have broken them down by um, three categories, general conditions for owner-occupied uh, dwellings and uh, non-owner-occupied dwellings. And then I created two other uh, categories, which are conditions specifically for owner-occupied dwellings and a third category specifically for non-owner-occupied dwellings. Just so you can see, you know, you know the the difference um, of of the of these um, sorts of conditions. So number one, um, Maureen, can I just let me say one thing before you go. These are typical um, conditions. Each special permit application may have other um, situations that need to be that the board wishes to address on a unique condition. So we're, the board isn't limited to these conditions. There may be other conditions that the board wishes to impose uh, on, a, on a special permit, but these are the ones that are more most typical and are used um, pretty frequently by the board. So I just wanted to make sure people didn't know that you, the board is not restricted to these conditions. Uh, just one thing I also wanted to add, floor plans are very important to enforcement because there are oftentimes we go into a property or into a house and um, we're seeing an extra bedroom that wasn't there before or we assume wasn't there, but we can also see what the, the original board authorized for bedrooms and where and somebody can't now decide that they've created two more. So it, it is an important reference in the archives for us to be able to, to go back and check what was approved at the time. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so number one, uh, the first condition, uh, the project shall be built in according to the approved plans and maintained as needed. Any changes from the following approved plan shall come back before the ZBA at a public meeting to determine whether the changes are de minimis. Um, meaning small, um, I don't know the official meaning, it's a, a Latin term. Um, if an, anyone knows the official definition, you can indicate. Uh, and therefore the said changes may be reviewed and or approved at the public meeting, or the changes are significant enough to require a formal modification of the permit and or condition. Um, the approved plans include the site plan, the building plans, which, the building plans include the elevation plans and the floor plans, the landscape plan and the lighting plan. Uh, and so, um, the, yeah, so this is uh, the condition number one. It's a standard condition for for all uh, all permits really that go through the ZBA. Um, and so this part, just to clarify, um, so if there was a change to the site plan, let's say, and maybe the change was to move maybe the trash can from the, you know, from the, that uh, when it was originally approved, it was on the back corner of the house on maybe one corner. Now they want to move it to the other back corner, you know, the, the the applicant would go to the the ZB at a, at a public meeting. They would look at the the updated site plan. They might do a site visit. They'll say, oh, you know, there won't be any adverse impacts to the neighbor. It's still being screened. It's just at the other corner of the house. Um, you as a board could vote to make that to determine that that's a de minimis small change, and you could just review and approve it at the public meeting. Um, uh, example, if the changes are significant to require a formal modification of the permit, um, say the, um, the site plan 
uh, the original site plan approved by the ZBA showed um, uh, four parking spots on the property for you know that dwelling, but now they're saying we need eight parking spaces. Um, so um, the you know they would go to the public meeting and 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 the applicant will make their case and you know it would my spe speculation is that the applicant would need to maybe expand the driveway um, add more asphalt maybe there needs to be a turnaround um, the lot coverage is going to change maybe the setbacks are going to change and maybe the amount of people living in the house or dwelling is going to change and and suddenly that 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 change seems to be significant enough to require a formal modification of that special permit. And so then that means that there would need to be a public hearing. And so there would be a legal ad required and the butters would be notified. And so and that's where um, that were requ the request would be reviewed and decided on by the board. So those are just um, two uh, examples. Of, of that condition. And then the second condition listed here um, is quite the same as number one, but uh, number one had to, has to do with what's being built, like site plan, building plan, landscape being and lighting. This con second condition has to do how, with how the project is being managed and that it, mean, it needs to be managed um, per the approved plans at all times. And, um, and, or, you know, and then it goes on to say, like, like the previous condition that, you know, if there's a de minimis change, it could be reviewed and approved at the public meeting, or, you know, if the changes are significant enough, they would require a uh, modification of, of the permit. And so the, um, these um, approved plans related to the management of the property include the management plan, the management plan, um, colon additional information required for any residential any residential rental the standard lease um, the complaint response plan and the parking management plan um, and this may I feel the board has um, received a parking management plan at times but not consistently and the town staff would like to make this a con consistent requirement for all uh, all uh, uh, permits uh, that uh, include parking. And so a uh, parking management um, provides a narrative, a written narrative of how the parking is going to be managed on the property and how it's going to be enforced by the property owner um, or the property management company. And so for instance, um, is the applicant going to assign the parking spaces um, are there going to be parking stickers or decals? Um, is there guest spots, uh, guest parking, um, things of that nature? Are there any ADA parking spaces? Um, are there any um, loading zones for like the UPS truck? Um, things of that nature. Um, so that would explain um, uh, how it's going to um, be managed and then there would be a parking plan that shows exactly where those parking spaces are shown um and then um and i guess that that would be uh th those would be the sort of the main elements and um we may staff may um come up with like a form to to indicate to applicants what this would need to include um or just a sort of a, a better uh description in the application um, so everyone is clear of what, what this means. Um, and so, um, and again, these, these are the sort of key elements uh, for, uh, for our inspection services to, um, to ensure, um, these are key conditions um, to, to put on this permit for inspection services to enforce. Um, th these these ones and as well of, as of course as you know the site plan the building plan the landscaping plan and the, the lighting plan. Um, number three, all rooms to be used as labeled on the approved floor plans. So this would just indicate the you know 
um, the floor plan, who who prepared it in, in that date. Uh, number four um, is uh, states all exterior lighting shall be designed and installed so as to be shielded or downcast and to avoid light trespass onto adjacent properties. Lighting fixtures shall be selected according to the dark sky compliance recommendations of the ZBA rules and regulations. Number five, no more than four unrelated individuals shall occupy each unit, uh, which is pursuant to the zoning bylaw. Um, if if um, a dwelling unit has a family, um, family members living there, then there is no um, limit on that as that, that would be um, a discriminatory um, um, matter. Um, but, but the zoning bylaw may limit the number of unrelated individuals living in one unit and in Amherst, we limit it to four unrelated individuals. Number six, any dwelling unit on the property being rented shall be registered and permitted in accordance with the residential rental permit, uh, permit bylaw. Seven, the street numbers for both dwellings shall be clearly marked with reflective signage and be visible from the public right of way from both directions. This is um, um, really helpful for our um, safety um, personnel, you know, fire and, and police and EMTs to um, clearly see the street number for these dwellings. So having a reflective sign um, stating those street numbers is very key for them, particularly. Number eight, parking shall occur on improved surfaces only, meaning it like asphalt or, or gravel, um, not grass. Grass is, it would not be an um, example of an improved surface. Um, the parking areas shall be maintained as needed. The parking and drive areas shall be constructed in accordance with the requirements of Article 7.1. The property shall be free of litter and debris. So those were the general conditions for dwelling units. Um, the, num the following um, are for, uh, conditions um, for owner occupied residential uses. So number 10, the maximum number of overnight visitors per non owner occupied dwelling unit shall be um, uh, so many people with a maximum number of so many consecutive nights. So the applicant would propose what these um, X's would indicate um, and so, um, and um, in this condition would be only applicable to that non-residential dwelling unit. So the, where the owner lives on the property, their dwelling unit would not need to um, account for this. Um, there would be no limit on, you know, overnight guests. So if grandma wants to stay for a couple months, grandma can stay um, in, in, in the owner's home. Uh, number 11, um, the maximum number of people on the premises at any time shall be um, blank number of people. So we, I, we leave it up to the applicant to propose with what this number is and it's, and then it's at the board's discretion to, you know, allow that a number or perhaps the board will say, mm, could you adjust that number um, to something that you feel that would be in more in line of um, keeping the neighborhood in harmony. Um, and so that would be, you know, said for number 10 as well, you know, if the board doesn't like the numbers um, being proposed for the condition number 10, um, you know, the board has the discretion to ask that applicant to modify that number um, as, as you're making those fi um, findings under 10.38, you know, you, you, you need to, to um, have a justification of, of, um, asking for different numbers. Number 12, on change of ownership of a non, oh, sorry, on change of ownership of a owner occupied rental permit, the new property owners shall be required to return to the ZBA at a public hearing for review and approval of the following plans. The management plan, additional information required for any residential rental, the lease, the complaint response plan, and the parking management plan. So this is um, new language um, for the board to consider. So a, park, a public hearing would, um, would entail that the neighbors that uh, are within 300 feet of the project site are notified by regular mail about the public hearing and then a legal ad would be placed in the Daily Hampshire Gazette 
um, as another way to notify the public about the public hearing. Um, standard conditions for non-owner occupied residential uses. Um, this condition is, I, I think the same from above, um, the maximum number of overnight visitors, oh, per unit, so both of the units, because it, um, both units would be non-owner occupied, shall be blank number of people with a maximum stay, stay of blank number of consecutive nights. Again, that would, that number would be determined with, you know, the applicant and, and the board's approval. Um, the maximum, number 14, the maximum number of people on the premises at any time shall be blank number of people. 15, upon, uh, upon becoming a non-owner occupied rental permit or change of ownership to a non-owner occupied rental permit, the following addition, following uh, additional conditions shall apply. Um, the new property owner applicant shall be required to return to the ZBA at a public hearing for review and approval of the following plans. The management plan, additional information required for any residential rental, the standard lease, complaint response plan, and the parking management plan. And, um, and then B, all grass area sh areas shall be regularly maintained. I believe that is, that is it. So um, wanted to, um, Here. All right. Actually, I just wanted to add that sometimes when I look back over special permits, you kind of read through the meeting minutes and try to understand what the board was thinking at the time. And you'll get a, an issue that comes up and they go back and forth and talk about it. But what really memorializes the end result is creating a condition that reflects what the board finally decided. And that's where conditions can come become very important, um, especially when it addresses a neighborhood concern. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would just like to add that, you know, so I went into typing these conditions with the idea that we would have, you know, would there be a possibility to sort of break down conditions for owner occupied versus non owner occupied. And they seem pretty similar. Um, and so similar that I don't know if, um, there needs to be two different categories. Um, were we um, thinking owner occupied would just be a public meeting initial, uh, initially just to get introduced to the new owners and management plan of that, or were we thinking going more towards the hearing as well? Uh, I'll let Rob or, um, John, speak to that. I'm just thinking of an owner-occupied duplex that would have to, upon sale, go back to a meeting or a hearing to reorg to reinstitute the duplex, as opposed to just, you know, updating their information. We talked about it a little bit today earlier, Dave, and what we thought was um, it. If there have been issues with the property, it gives it gives the neighbors a chance to weigh in on that, and you might you might recondition it at that time. Yeah. Yeah, I think that what it provides is, that especially in cases where you have a really old special permit and the and things have changed, the town's expectations and and what people expect from rental property in town has changed or the neighborhood has changed, you may want to, you may want to um, adjust some of the conditions um, for that property. And if you want to do that in response to a public hearing, if there is um, some kind of uh, um, neighborhood or, or public concern expressed that can be, that's reasonable and can be uh, managed through a condition. So I think the public hearing, but I, but I also am, I'm sensitive to the fact that I don't want to make, so in the case of an owner-occupied sale um, to some other an owner owner-occupied rental property being sold to another person who's going to be an owner-occupied uh, and going to manage the property, I don't want that to be at risk. You know, I don't want the whole them to be 
worried that they're going to buy the property and they may not have a special permit. So one of the things that we should think about is how do we permit the, the new owner in the course of the transaction when we have a bona fide offer for this property. The new owner comes before the board, not returned to the zoning board of appeal, but the new property owner appears before the board and he can appear before the board before the, the property is the transaction is finalized and said, these would be the, this is what I propose for the management plan. I'm going to adopt exactly what the original person did or I want to make these following changes. Here's my lease. It's going to be different than what the lease was from somebody else. I've changed certain things in it. And here's my parking management plan. I, this is how I wish to. And then the board could make, has that at a public hearing. The, the public has a chance to respond and the board has a chance to respond as well and either approve or deny it. And you haven't, you don't run the potential of delaying the tr transaction or having the transaction take place and the uh, board not approving the, um, uh, the management plan or the complaint response plan of the new owner subsequent to the transaction. So I think one of, one of the things we want to do in order to not burden um, transactions or owners too much is to try to get this in as soon as possible. And that in, once a bona fide transaction is um, a bona fide offer is, has been made for the property. Rob or Maureen, do you know how to, how, how we can do that with this uh, in this condition by changing the language or is that, is there time to do that so that we, um, it, considering the amount of time for a public hearing, is there enough time to do that and still have the transaction take place and not to, and not make our decision after the transaction has already taken place, and so that the new owner has knowledge of this before it's finalized? Yeah, I, I think that staff needs to sort of discuss whether, for uh, particularly for owner occupied property, you know, does the pending new owner need to come before the ZBA before they purchase the home or can it be within so many, you know, within a month or two after the, you know, the, per the, the purchase and sale has gone through. Um, so that's question number one. Um, if it was before, uh, if, if, if the person, if the potential buyer does need to come before the board before the purchase and sale is uh, finalized, um, you know, part of the due diligence of the, the, um, real estate agent and the lawyer that is, uh, handling that, that purchase and sale it is doing uh, a deed research of the property. And so they will be, um, looking for anything related to, to that, uh, to that property. And they would be finding any, um, you know, special permits, variances, anything that is permitted on that property that's been recorded with the registry of deeds. And so they would be looking at, you know, that decision um, and they would see that condition um, if, if that was included that, it, you know, if there was a con condition that said that the new prospective buyer needs to come before the board before the purchase and sale to, re to review the, um, you know, the management plan, uh, the lease, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, I, I feel that, that the lawyer would capture that and there would be um, a good enough time um, for them to uh, handle that before, before the purchase and sale. Similar to how the board actually just handled, um, was it 19 oh, Phillips Street? 19 um, Phillips Street. So that was handled before the purchase and sale um, was uh, agreed upon. Um, and so that was just factored in with their, you know, their, their um, sort of timeline for selling the property. And, um, you know, I, I think that they're going, going to be able to, to um, finalize that purchase and sale in December, so so that that was able to um, they were able to deal deal with this. Um, it seemed easily, so I think that it could be handled um, easily um, for future applications. Uh, 
Well, I think one of the purposes of some of these conditions that we were trying to create was to not have to worry about a possibility of needing to add more conditions in the future um, and making it a little bit easier for the owner occupied properties or something similar to that. Um, I, I realize you can't capture everything, but um, I think our history and experience has led to what we have today. Um, because if you look back at the conditions in the past, they were very limited because at the time people didn't worry about things like this, uh, but now they do. And we've addressed it with what you've presented here. So, um, I mean, that's something to think about as well. Ms. Parks. Um, I'm just wondering if you have some ballpark numbers for those X's. Um, or if it would be related to like the size of the property or something like that. I guess I'm just trying to think if we need to put it in perspective, what we what the town thinks is a reasonable number of people to spend the night for a reasonable number of days. I guess that would be helpful to me. I mean, I, we've, I, I think we, you know, we can tell if it's really ridiculous, but I'm not sure if there's like a kind of a range that we would that the town's hoping for sure uh, you know I, I would say with that it, it, it can't necessarily be a, only one factor okay it would have to be a compilation of multiple factors um so you know you you suggested tammy is it the lot size sure that could be num one of the factors um other factors could be the you know is, is there a, enough parking spaces in the driveway to accommodate, um, you know, that guest who's staying a few nights or whatever the scenario is, um, or is there on street parking um, to accommodate um, that guest um, to, to have a, a location to park? Um, and how many, you know, what's the size of the dwelling unit? Is it a 300 square foot dwelling unit where it probably doesn't make sense to have, you know, multiple guests stay over, or is it, you know, a 14,000 square, um, 1400 square foot apartment um, that, um, that has maybe an extra bedroom. Um, so th I think there are multiple factors that the board should consider um, when an applicant is proposing a certain number about overnight guests or gatherings. Um, Hopefully that gives you some guidance. John, do you have any questions or suggestions? Yeah, there's some mass general law about this. Um, guests may stay a maximum of 14 days in a six month period or seven nights consecutively on the property. Any guest residing at the property for more than 14 days in a six month period or spending more than seven nights consecutively will be considered a tenant. Hmm. Yeah, I think it would be good to have that with with this, you know, with the this zoning information. I was unaware of the state law. I just Googled Massachusetts landlord tenant law overnight guests, and that's what came up. If something is a state law, do we need to include it as a condition? Or is it already a condition? Good point. You know, I, I think it's helpful to include it as a condition only because, you know, with John bringing it up right now, that's something that he just made a lot of people aware of this law existing. And as people look back over time, same thing. If you have it in the conditions, it lives with the property, it's right there front and center, easy reference. Otherwise, somebody's going to have to do some research or have this knowledge already to, to look back and know or in reference it. So I, I think it is helpful. Gonna add um, over the board of licensing, we, uh, we typically will put in regulations, uh, things that are already state law, stuff like, well, you have to be 21 to drink, we'll, we'll leave that out. But things that are less obvious, we'll usually include there for that, that very reason of, well, you wanna look at these laws, you don't have to then go also look up state law it never really hurts to include something redundant like that.
And you know, my only, my thoughts about the gathering number is one of the things that um, you want to control a little bit. I don't know what the magic number is, but large gatherings that we sometimes see with rental properties, that could be 120 people for a single family. So that seems a little extreme as a rental property. I wouldn't be as concerned if it was a, a single family with a family living there and they're having a, a family gathering. But um, you know, it's that kind of consideration, but also we've left it up to the, uh, the landlord to decide how many people do you want on this property that you think you can manage as well. And it seems to me that in, in, for the um, maximum number of people at a time, it's going to depend upon the property. Not only do we take the, the, the owner's, the property owner's suggestion, and we look at that and evaluate it, but you see what the property is like. If you've got a small lot in the middle of town, 120 people is too many, no matter what. Um, but that 120 people may be able to be accommodated for a big, or for a large number of people may be able to be accommodated if you have a very large lot and you're outside the, the uh, downtown area and it's a graduation party for, or whatever it is. So I, I think it varies. There's some places where 20 people is an awful lot of people and, and, this, and other this, places where it wouldn't be. This actually happens. I just was at a property down on lower main street where, you know, the police broke up a, a, a party and the police count was uh, 300 people. And when we went there to talk to the tenants about it, they said, no, it's no way there was a 300 people. I said, well, you know, what was your count? Not more than 150. Okay, 150 people in your backyard, you know, at two o'clock in the morning, that's a problem for your neighbors. So I, I think, Tammy, you had a good question. I think a lot of it will depend upon where the property is. I mean, it can depend upon where the property is and it can vary. But the first answer is that we, we do seek the uh, input from the owner and we begin at that with that number and then we make an evaluation from there. But the guidance of the state law would be, um, it, it's good to know. I did not, I did not know that before. I don't want to dominate the conversation. So I want, I have another question, but if anybody else has something, I want to make sure that they get a chance to ask their questions. Yeah, I've got a question, just kind of yeah. kind of general. Um, and I guess it would be, so kind of one of my concerns, one of the, the things I really want to know, so you hear it a lot that, you know, supposedly Amherst is expensive to do business and it's expensive to, to deal with it, you know, perhaps more than other towns. And, you know, I don't know, people will always complain about whatever. I don't know. I don't know if we have any real there exists any data of what the cost is to get, you know, a, a, on average, what a special permit is in Amherst than it is maybe in surrounding towns. Is there some reason for that um, that might just make perfect sense of, oh, well, when you consider this about Amherst, of course, it's going to be much more costly to do it. But I don't know, maybe, John, you even might have an idea. You said you were a CBA in, in Shutesbury. Um, yeah, so when I was on the... Um... ZBA in Shutesbury, I've, you know, we were charging people a hundred dollars to apply for a special permit. It was at that time costing $350 to do the legal advertising. That's the people of Shutesbury subsidizing your special permit. Uh, I don't, they wouldn't be happy about that. <laughs> and, you know, we were, we raised the cost when, when I found that out. What's it in Amherst, Maureen? For what? For to, fees to apply for, for a special permit? Uh, it varies um, from the intensity of the use. Uh, we have um, for, um, let's say, uh, for like a duplex, I think it's about 275 total. And what's it cost to advertise that? So, okay. And so to back up, so the fee for that duplex is, I think, maybe $200 and then the legal ad is $75. So the grand total is 275. The legal ad charged by the Gazette is roughly $800. That's Whoa. the people of, that's the, that's the taxpayers really? of Amherst paying for that. Yeah, and so I will say that um, communities, you know, across the Commonwealth are dealing with this 
And I, you know, perhaps Rob, um, you know, wants to talk about this, I guess, but like, uh, you know, I think communities are grappling with, do we charge homeowners or applicants in general, you know, eight, $800, uh, give or take for a legal ad. And, you know, I worked in Greenfield prior to Amherst and um, they treat it just like Amherst where they, in essence, subsidize the legal ad fee because they don't want to put that, you know, strand, strain on a homeowner or, or applicant in general. Um, so it's it's kind of a, a tough dilemma, I, I, I think, for communities to oh. how to deal with that. So, and I would say besides the legal ad element, uh, I think the fees in general are probably, you know, uh, I haven't, I have looked at fees in communities um, in the past. I haven't looked on that research in a few years, but I think it is comparable to uh, um, other surrounding communities, um, our fees. Um, and if you compare it to Eastern Mass, you, you know, some of the fees you, you, you may say in Amherst are very, you know, uh, low. Um, so it's, it's dependent on who you're comparing, comparing the community to. Who sets the fees? Isn't, don't we have in the ZBA bylaws, the, 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 we have, the fees are established in the bylaws? I was just going to Yeah, you do it. You, you yeah, we do it, right? The board, yep. the board um, sets the fees. Um, and I, does, and, are, are those then approved by the town council or do we have the authority to set the fees ourselves? I think it is outlined in the ZBA rules and regs. And yeah. I can't recall at this moment. Hmm. Yep. I mean, I do remember recall that they were listed there and I didn't know if we had to get approval from the town council or whatever to adjust those fees. Yeah, I don't know the top of okay. my head. Um, generally, it, Rob, do you have any thought on on the sub on subsidization of that fee? I mean, it means that if for a later time, we're not going to deal with this tonight. But at a later point in time, if we if it is something that troubles us, it means that in order for a homeowner who wants a special permit because he needs a he's, he has he encroaches on a lot line or something else, but for you know for a homeowner to do a, a twenty thousand dollar kitchen bump out that, and he needs a special permit to do that, he's got to pay a, in effect $1,000 just in fees and then in, in publication notices. I mean, that can be a significant, that can be a significant expense, but if you've got a, a huge development um, and you're talking a multi-million dollars, 800 bucks to, for is a cost of doing business. And it, not, it doesn't seem to me to be particularly um, onerous to charge for a multi-million dollar project project, uh, you know, have them pay for the, the newspaper advertisement. Um, what's, what, what, what does other, what do other departments do with this kind of stuff and other boards? Well, so, um, you know, as more important out, it's something that we watch and look at every year, um, particularly during budget time. Uh, yeah. You know, we're constantly looking at our, expend, our expenses for the, the previous year and estimating what we're going to need for these, uh, these accounts. And what I can tell you is that, you know, when it becomes a, a big enough concern for the conservation and development department's budget, you would hear a recommendation from staff to reconsider the fee schedule. Um, you know, we, we have the luxury of looking at our overall budget uh, across three departments. Uh, so, you know, whether it's taking in permit, building permit fees, you know, where there might be an excess of uh, above our expenditures for that, uh, that division, uh, you know, might offset, you know, some of the additional costs that were, you know, we're, we're showing in the negative for a planning department um, advertisement uh, costs. So, you know, we're always looking at that, uh, you know, we don't want to, I think, you know, changing the fees particularly now, you know, would definitely be, you know, uh, a negative, um, you know, for the, for the applicant, you know, in the, in the conservation department, for example, you know, the applicant does pay the fee uh, for the legal ad, you know, gets billed directly to them. 
um, you know, and that's pretty common in, in most communities to, to have it handled that way. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways we could, we could address it. Uh, it does come down from a financial review perspective and, and whether or not it becomes an issue that we need to look at closer or try to make some adjustments for. Uh, but, you know, we're just starting budget season for this year. So uh, I know the rates have gone up and we'll be looking at that again. Thank you. And um, I, if you if I'm sharing my screen properly, um, th this is the f fee schedule for ZBA applications. It's part of the ZBA. Uh, it's part of the the actual ZBA application form, so you can look at it at your leisure. But it shows you the breakdown of of uh, fees by the um, impact. Mm -hmm. So there's a high impact uses, moderate impact uses, and low impact uses. So for applicants for uh, owner occupied single family property, such as accessory uses or supplemental apartments, fences, signs, or you know something minor for owner occupied property. It's it's um, it's just fifty dollars plus that seventy five dollar legal ad. So I guess that's one twenty five. And then you see it, it um, gets um, you know more expensive as the intensity of the proposed use um, increases. Maureen, I'm, I'm I, maybe I'm confused. So we have one. We have a fee that they pay to the town. The town has a fee that they paid for the advertisement um, in the in the in the Gazette, and then there's a legal as well. Are there, are there three different? What, where's the where's the eight hundred dollars? So so the applicant would pay. Um, so let's pretend that an applicant is is proposing a accessory dwelling unit to their single family home. Right. The fee for the application fee would be $50 right. here plus a flat fee of $75 for the legal advertise advertisement so that would be $125 they would write a check out to the town of Amherst and then and then planning staff then types up the legal ad for the public hearing and um and that gets and you paid the $800 the yeah. town does got it, got it. Yeah. okay all right. And um, just to clarify, so there's two legal ads. Um, the or sorry, the legal ad needs to be published twice in the in the paper, and that is um, uh, a requirement under Mass General Law, Chapter Forty, mm -hmm. Section I think Eleven. Um, and so that is why, you know, it's costly so and that's on sort of the average it could it's based on the amount of letters that are used mm -hmm. in the legal ad so um it could be like 750 sometimes it could be it it, it that's just sort of the ballpark guesstimate i'm providing um so that's helpful though mr meadows you were going to say something it, yeah i was so is it the zba that sets the the amounts that are called for, or is it the town planning department that determines how much they're going to pay? I think it's our rules and regulations. The fees to the town are are decided by the ZBA. Could could we possibly, you know, have is that right? There? Rob, am I wrong? Yeah, no, I, I think you're right. I think we we typically bring the, the fee schedules and adjustments to the boards and committees for for their approval. But um, you know, the recommendation starts from staff typically. Um, you know, which again is you know based on our budget situation. Um, so uh, you know, we'll we take kind of prompts from the finance department on things like that as they're reviewing. Uh, fees collected and expenses for the overall department each year. For example, you know, we haven't raised building permit, electrical plumbing permits uh, fees the entire time I've been working for the town almost 10 years because we haven't had it. Could we possibly get a comparative analysis with let's say six or eight other towns to see what they're charging for similar 
fees. So that, you know, yeah. I'm it's sure you can give us a good recommendation, but it'd be nice to know what others are doing. Okay. Yep. Other suggestions or other questions? Ms. Parks. I just actually have a couple of questions that might be kind of dumb, but I'm just wondering. Um, so for, for a, a single, if I were renting out a house, if I have a 10 bedroom house, but it only has one kitchen, I can still only rent to four people, right? Is that unrelated correct? Unrelated people. Four unrelated, unrelated people. Okay. So now I have a house that has four bedrooms and two people are married. There's two couples. Can someone else move in? I'll let Rob are, are they all something. related? They're not all related. They're only related by marriage. I just had this, you know, two, okay. two of the kids are twins and their friends are also twins and their best friend from kindergarten. So can we have five? No. Okay, that's what I was wondering. Like, is if if you had four bedrooms, could you have four married couples? Because they're unrelated to each other, but they're related. They're related to the person in the room, not the other people. So you can't have that, right? It's that's correct. People. You can't have that. It's four people, unless you're blood related. Okay, and then if you have, it's a minimum of two parking spaces. But can you have ten parking spaces? I mean, it doesn't. It at that point, it doesn't matter. Well, well, lot, so lot coverage would would come in. So, you know, how how much hard surface do you have on the property? I guess. Right. I guess I'm just thinking of you know someone has a house that has say a, a five bedroom house with a lot of parking. They still can only have four unrelated people, and they still only need to have two spaces. Right. It just that's what it always goes back to. I, I just you know I wonder about these things occasionally, and I. So I thought I'd clarify. So that's the case, right? I mean, I, I, if if there's ten spaces, it doesn't it doesn't matter as long as there's enough lot coverage, as long as right. they. Yeah, yeah, yep. Well, at the moment, yes. So uh, the planning department is actually proposing a parking uh, uh, zoning amendment to the parking section, um, which would um, require. Um, the, the parking ratio right now is uh, under the zoning bylaw um, says uh, there should be a minimum of two parking spaces per dwelling unit. Um, and the proposal is um, indicating that the minimum and maximum should be uh, allowed should be two parking spaces per dwelling unit, unless um, the special permit, unless the board uh, determines that, you know, a, um, a different ratio um, is adequate. So, you know, if an ab ap applicant wants to propose less parking than two, uh, two parking spaces, um, they could request that. Or if they wanted to request more than two parking spaces because they have five bedrooms for their, you know, for mom, dad, grandma, and grandpa, and and their, you know, their their child, for instance. Um, you know, they could make a request to say that they need, you know, five parking spaces or, or whatever that ratio is, um, but they would need to provide uh, evidence that, you know, that that's a reasonable request. So, um, you know, for instance, they would need to show that that property would have enough space for, for the parking spaces, they meet the lock coverage. Um, for instance, they meet all the, the setback requirements, um, things of that nature. Um, so, you know, again, um, so that that's that's the um, the proposed uh, language as is. But you know, the board has the discretion now to, um, you know, indicate that you know if there's, um, for instance, maybe um, an apartment building being proposed and. They're all the apartment, um, the apartment uh, units have, you know, maybe three bedrooms. Each of the apartments all have three bedrooms and or more or something. 
the board has the discretion to say, actually, each of those apartment units need to have three parking spaces. Um, and um, so you, the board has, um, again, the discretion to sort of determine what is uh, the uh, the appropriate or the adequate amount of parking based on, you know, the intensity of the use and other factors. Um, so the board has sort of the flex. The board has the flexibility now and with the zoning proposal to sort of determine what is the accurate uh, and appropriate amount of parking. It it just seems to my mind that if you have four bedrooms and you have four adults living there, that you would have four parking spaces. And so I think it probably creates a conflict unless you're very close to the university or someone's riding a bike of who gets to park there. And so yeah, I, it, I, would, I mean, normally wherever wherever I've ever lived, it's it's one it's like you know you have to have enough parking per bedroom or whatever. So I it's minimal here to me. Yeah, and so the ZBA has in the past, before your time, Tammy, has made a condition of you know um, of of a, a special permit for you know apartment building. I, I don't know what the use you know something of that nature. And um, they did uh, require that, you know, there are um, a parking space provided per bedroom being proposed. So that four unit apartment, um, they required that, you know, four parking spaces are provided. Um, so it, again, it, the board has the discretionary power to sort of determine you know what the part the the appropriate appropriate amount of parking is and, you know and another factor you know you said like oh well unless it's downtown um you know yeah you know the, the applicant could say yeah we're on the bus route we're in walking distance of umass and you know we don't actually want to have four parking spaces for that four unit uh, you know dwelling unit you know that could be a, a reasonable you know re request to the board but you know if that four unit apartment building maybe is on southeast street that doesn't have uh, is not along the bus bus line and is in the outskirts of town um it that seems kind of questionable if they're saying you know they don't want to provide any parking or they want to provide less parking than what's required um, you know, the board, it, it'd be interesting to hear the board's sort of finding on that. And while there is a minimum amount of parking, it would be beneficial to the owners to provide enough parking for four tenants if four one half cars and maybe an extra for a guest. But if they were to say put 10 spaces in, and we regularly see 10 cars parked there every day, 30 days out of the month. Now we can kind of figure there's something going on here and they're, they're overpopulated. So, you know, it, it, you got to take each property by, you know, how it, what happens there. But yeah, I mean, it would make sense to provide a little extra if mm -hmm. you can and lot coverage allows. Yeah, and, and so that would be, a determination um, on you know a case by case basis um, of you know what what makes sense you know is there guest parking uh, for instance um, how many parking spaces per bedroom um, is that something that you would want to factor in is it along the bus route is it close to downtown is it in the outskirts of town. Um, what are the demographics of that apartment building? Is it for seniors or low income individuals or is um, are there any other locational or economic or demographic factors that you want to account for? Um, so it's definitely a case by case um, basis in determining what's a, the you know appropriate or, uh, or adequate amount of parking. Yeah, if they don't provide enough parking, they end up parking all over the lawn, then they end up getting ticketed by John. So, I mean, it's their, to their benefit to provide enough. I had, I had one question on conditions one and I think two, where we talk about de minimis changes. If you could bring, bring that up, Maureen.
Um, when you look at this, here's what I would like to what I would like to see is a, a process where truly de minimis uh, changes to the site plan, building plans, landscape plan, lighting plan, or the management plans, truly de minimis changes can be decided by the staff, can be approved by the staff. And that something that is more than that has to come to us and we decide, yep, yeah, we think this is not a big deal. We don't need a public hearing for this, or we need, or this is a big deal. We need a public hearing. Because I, I, I see times, I think you guys must see it too there, where you've got a, a floor plan and the owner of the property wants to move a wall two feet to make one bedroom bigger, one bedroom smaller, or to move the kitchen, whatever it is. But it's not, I don't know that we should be approving or we should have be taking up our time and meetings to say that's all right. That's just, that's a de minimis change. We approve it in a, in a public meeting. or there's a change in the lease. Uh, and, and you look at number two, uh, we, we have to see the, the, the lease. If you scroll down a little bit, Maureen. Um, standard lease. It, you got leases change, uh, not just the rental, the amount of the rent, but other, other requirements, um, all sorts of things change. And I don't think that we should be in the position as the board of having to approve changes in leases. You know, those are, those are de minimis changes that I think the staff can look at and say, you know, this is another standard lease. It's pretty much, it doesn't create any problems. Um, and they should be able to go ahead and make those changes without having to come to come to the board to make the change, the owner, property owner having to come to the board and having us declare it as a, as a small change. Um, and I, I know the, the problem with that for some people would be, well, we, you know, that is our, our job is to oversee, you know, making sure that this does, that these, um, the property owners and the comply with the special permit and that they actually live up and they, and they don't change it. They tell us when they're gonna make a change. Um, but I think that if the staff would just prepare a list every, every six months of de minimis changes that they have approved, share it with the chair or share it with the whole board, um, and we could look at it and say, yep, that seems to make a ton of sense. We could respond to changes and requests from owners more, and property owners more quickly. We would reduce the amount of, of um, time that we take on those kinds of things and reduce, um, and reduce actually the, the burden on staff because you don't have to set up a meeting. You don't have to do everything else in staff a meeting for something that you might just be able to uh, sign off on. And I think the problem is how do we define de minimis? How do we def give the staff the uh, comfort that when they look at something, they say, this is something the board is comfortable with us making the decision on. And they have, they have tasked us to do that and not feel uncomfortable. And we have to be comfortable that they're following that judgment. I, I am pretty comfortable with that. Um, but if we need to have some kind of oversight, we could certainly have them uh, keep a, a log of all the de minimis changes they've approved and we can review it once a year or once every six months to see if that's, you know, see if they, we still believe it is de minimis and it's being followed in the way we intend. So I'd like to figure out a way to, to phrase these two conditions so that we don't have to approve every de minimis change at a public meeting. The staff can quickly, can quickly decide what it wants to do. And three, property managers can get their that approval more quickly than they otherwise would. So can we work on trying, can you work on trying to change that? Uh, number one, does the rest of the board agree with that? And number two, if they do, can we find a way to try to recast that, um, those two conditions to uh, accommodate that? I'll do Mr. Jack Field. Yeah, I, I very much agree with that assessment of that. I think that's, that's a really, really good approach to that. Mr. Mora, can, you're, 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 you're going to have to figure out how to write this. Can you, can you, is there a way to do it? And how do we give you comfort to make that decision that something is de minimis? Yeah, yeah there's absolutely a way to do it. And we'll, we'll uh, put some language together and, and bring it back to you to, to look at. But 
um, you know, it really is what we do now, though. So th these mm -hmm. conditions are what are being considered as maybe proposed list of conditions. We don't actually use this specific condition yeah. uh, or we haven't for some time. So the language that are in the conditions today does give authority uh, and we often make decisions and, and uh, choose whether or not something comes back to the board. Um, and I was just looking at the way the planning board handles it. We, you know, we wrote it into the bylaw uh, that a change to an approved, a previously approved plan um, shall be submitted to the building con commissioner to determine if the change is significant. And the commissioner shall either approve it as a minor alteration or advise the applicant to make the submission to the planning board. So, you know, we're, we want to be, you know, as consistent as we can yep. be if the boards are comfortable with it. So, uh, yeah, we'll absolutely propose some language to do what, uh, what you and, and Dylan also supports, um, you know, and, and unless there's other comments, we'll, we'll uh, get some language back to you to see. Great. Anybody have a comment about that or feel differently? I... That's great. Good. I think that's a reasonable way to resolve that. Um, and then the last thing I had is just about the word return to the, that when we're talking about change of ownership, I just want to make sure that we draft that condition so that there is, um, in anticipation before the before the ownership actually transfers. And so just, I think it ought to be revised so that number one, we can see that in once there's a bona fide offer, I don't think we wanna be doing this prospectively, just, you know, it doesn't make any sense to, to um, you can't get the new management plan before there's a real, there's gonna be a new manager, a new owner. So, but, so that we're in the process of the, the, the transaction and um, and I think so returning to the, the board isn't the right thing, uh, but we could some way state that the new property owner shall be, um, or the new potential uh, prospective owner or property owner can, uh, shall be required to appear before the Zoning Board of Appeals at a public hearing for review, just some, to make that clear that it doesn't have to take place after the ownership has happened. Sure. Yeah, we can definitely uh, yep. play with that language. Like that, just so we have so we have standard language that we can use in the future. So we're not making it up each time because we all have a lot of good ideas right at the moment, and sometimes they've already been thought of, and people have figured it out. And we could use it. It's helpful to use things that have already been figured out. Does anybody else have questions about the conditions about? Anything we've talked about tonight or have something they want to discuss um, amongst us as, in this administrative meeting? I mean, well, great. Uh, say, go ahead, Dylan. I was just going to say, I feel like I had so much, but now we're hitting that point, 8.30 at night. I feel like I'm starting to get a little sleepy here. Yep. Well, it is 8.30. Um, if you want it, we can schedule another one if we got more, Dylan, um, if, you, if you think this, if this is helpful. Uh, yeah, I would say I think I think we should see if we can try to do these a little bit more periodically, maybe once every three months, something like that, where we know it's coming up that way, just as we kind of work through cases, we can kind of think, you know, do we want to sit down for even maybe an hour or so, something like that in the meeting, just be like, let's talk about what we've gone over the last couple of months. I think something like that would be helpful just so we can regularly touch base like this and not try to shove stuff in right in the, mm -hmm. the, the last bit at the end of meetings. Sure. Maureen, you have your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted um, to see uh, if, if uh, folks had any um, thoughts about the um, the complaint response plan we didn't really touch upon that tonight um and that is that something uh, so a, a complaint response plan is a requirement for residential dwelling units um that you know um that need zba approval 
and uh, it, the form is a way for well the applicant needs to fill it out it's if if i think the applicant is um, not available to take a, a complaint by the tenant themselves maybe they're out of town or whatever the situation is um, it lists uh, three other persons um, that the tenant or maybe the neighbors could contact if there is an issue going on 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 that property um, and I just wanted to see if if that's something that the board you know finds useful does enforcement services find it useful is it something that the board wants to continue using for you know all residential uses you know um, particularly owner occupied uh, properties and, and or non owner occupied properties. I didn't know if um, john or Rob or Dave had any general comments about that form. And so whether it's yeah my my comments are uh, just to you know. Um, let everyone know that that complaint response form was developed before we had the rental regulations, rental bylaw, and it, and it was you know it was brought by a ZBA member, a, a chair of, of the ZBA that really felt strongly about having those uh, contacts established as part of supporting the application. So to me, you know, years later with the rental regulations and what John talked about earlier. Uh, we essentially have that. We have, you know, the, the emergency contact information. John, when he's looking for somebody, whether it's the owner, the owner's representative, a local agent, he's expecting to get a hold of somebody and get a response within a certain amount of time. And that's all established in the rental regulations. So the complaint response plan to me is, is you know, if the board wanted to continue with it, is more about what is the plan? You know, you know, what is the response going to be? What, who, who is available? Is it a, is it an agent? Is it the owner? Understanding those pieces, not so much the form with the three, uh, the three contacts and the days of the week checked off. I think we've kind of moved past the, you know, the need for that form. Uh, but, but as far as a complaint response plan being part of the overall management of the property i think that's still something important for the board to hear and 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 um, be comfortable with when judging these uh, decisions john feel free to add anything same rob i yeah most of that information we've captured somewhere else at this point but it, it would be nice to hear these applicants have thought about this you know that the, the there's, there may be an emergency. What are you going to do if there is? I mean, the other option would be to require it as part of the rental registration to have additional names available if needed. I mean, and then that's taken care of already if we haven't already. So if a, a tenant has a complaint, um, something's not getting fixed. They can try to they can try to reach the landlord directly, and if they don't have don't get satisfaction, they can go to the town. Um, they call me. Yeah, they call you, and they have to know that somehow. You know, they're pretty savvy. Um, sometimes they don't want to complain because they don't. Maybe they got five people living there. They don't want to rock the boat. You know, um, but other times they feel like. They're paying eight hundred and fifty dollars a room. They, the room ought to ought to meet a, a some sort of a minimum standard for habitation. They they're pretty savvy that way. You know, I I also one one other way I get complaints that I didn't talk about is from student legal services at UMass. Sometimes the kids just go get a lawyer first. Um, and then and then you know I have a very close working relationship with that. Um, agency at UMass, they, they just uh, call me up or they tell the kids, hey, call John. Hmm. Well, I think this is something we should explore. Um, I was, this is a, a benefit of this meeting is learning more about the rental um, program, rental uh, permit 
and what it allows a town to do. Um, because on, on surface, the complaint response form itself seemed to make sense, but if it's du duplicative of other information and doesn't give us the plan, the right plan, as Rob talked about, um, it doesn't do us any good and it just creates more work without any benefit. So perhaps so I guess we, uh, we, staff could work on, you know, in the coming months or, um, you know, yeah. how, how could that complaint response plan um, yes. you know, pivot to something that is more functional and useful than- And coordinates with the, with the residential rental program. Yeah, yeah. I, could I think that. you're right. I think you're exactly right, Maureen. Okay. Other people agree with that? Mr. Dillon, Mr. Maxwell? Oh, I've, I've just got a follow-up question, but yeah, that, that does yeah. sound good. Anything else on this before we go to Mr. Maxfield's question? Okay, Mr. Maxfield? I was gonna ask, um, is there anybody you would say in town you've dealt with, John, that is a, um, I don't know, a, a repeat offender that it feels like you're, you deal with quite frequently? Um, and of that, those people, would you say it, it's something where they're really dropping the ball or maybe it's students are just going to you first before going to the landlord? Uh, you absolutely have some problem landlords, yes. Mm -hmm. And and often um, it's what I said, the, the, the occupants are in cahoots. They, um, they, they'll put up with, with a certain amount of um, problem with the place because they don't want to rock the boat. Now, what, what happens to, um, what happens to, to people who it's found out they're living uh, over occupancy, five people in a, a three bedroom or a four bedroom, you find out about it, you go in there. What happens to the people who are living there? We haven't been, we haven't made a practice of putting people out of their, you know, dwellings. Um, we would try to address it at the end of the lease term um, with some more vigorous management on the landlord's part. Okay, so if it ends up being that you find somebody. They're not out on the street, no. Yeah. But if it's a health, if it's a health issue or safety it, issue, they can be, right? Yes. I mean, this is, yeah, exactly. it, it, there's, there's two different things here. So one is, one is the, um, almost the financial benefit to having six people in a four people room and that's, but it's not unsafe. It's just, it violates zoning. The other thing is uh, in particular, if you have an unsafe condition and there are some of those that has happened. Where you a found lot of unsafe. Yeah. I mean, yes, we find kids living in attics. We find them living in basements. Um, right. so it, yeah, it, it looks, the financial thing works out for everybody, but it's not safe. And you, but then you don't let it stay, do you? No, you we can't let them down. stay. I, no, yeah. it gets shut down. Right. Okay. Well, I think this was, even though it was, it was longer than I anticipated, I think it was really, I found it helpful. I hope you did as well. Um, I think there's a lot of good information and a lot of, a lot that we can take from this and try to kind of standardize some of our, our concerns. I think I learned a lot and I hope it was helpful for everybody else. Um, I'll, I want to specifically thank the staff for putting it all together. Maureen, thank you so much. Um, John, welcome for joining us. It's your first time with us. Thanks. Rob and David, thank you as always. It's, it was really helpful. Um, before we leave, are there any other questions that, of anything that we, that we discussed that you want to add before we go to public comment? Great. Um, this is the next order of agenda, on the agenda is public comment. So anybody from the public? can speak on anything that we did not discuss that was not the subject of the meeting tonight. And I don't think there's anybody, Maureen, is there anybody listening? It's just no. us, just us folks, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Is there a second? I hear a second. This is not a debatable motion. Um, Chair votes aye. Ms. Parks. Aye. Mr. Maxfield. Aye. Mr. Meadows. Aye. Mr. Gilbert. Aye. We are adjourned.
Thanks again, everybody. Thanks for the invitation. We'll talk to you soon. Bye. Thank you all.